I am making a platformer game with unlimited jumps. That means you can jump around like this. It's like Flappy Bird but better. Anyway, this is the second devlog. So go watch the first devlog if you haven't. Now let's begin. Today we're gonna improve this game by adding new enemies and making the graphics better. But before that we're gonna switch from using two variables to using the SFML vectors. That'll make things a little more organized. Since we're making a hardcore platformer, the player will die a lot. Like really a lot. So I added a condition that if the player dies, will automatically restart the game. It works! But now we have a new problem. Since we're immediately restarting the game after death, we're not showing the death animation. So that means no one will see this amazing animation which I worked really hard on. To fix this I made a vector of death animations. When the player dies, we're gonna add a new element to that vector. We're also gonna remove an animation when it's over. For now we're gonna draw the animations at the player's position. Alright, let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe it's crashing because we're using unique pointers. Let's try using shared pointers instead. Um. Well, the good news is the game is not crashing anymore. After spending hours trying to use smart pointers, I finally realized that I should use raw pointers instead. When we're deleting the animation objects, we're also deleting these smart pointers. And these pointers are automatically deleting the manager objects. So if you think that using smart pointers will make you smart, they won't. And after I switched to using raw pointers, everything started working. Now we need to draw them where the player died instead of the player's current position. I made a separate vector for that. It's gonna store the position where the player died and whether or not we should flip the sprite. I also made sure that we restart the game only once when we press the restart button. We're gonna do the same thing we did with the jump button which is checking its previous state. Alright, it seems to be working. It's time we add enemies. We're gonna make a new class for each enemy. But, there's a catch. See, each enemy class will have its own hitbox, its own position, its own draw function, its own update function, etc. But we already wrote everything in the player class. Does that mean you're gonna rewrite everything for each class? What? No. Who do you think I am? Um, you? Okay, maybe I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb, alright? Anyway, we're gonna use inheritance so I made an entity class. It's gonna serve as a base for every new entity we're gonna add. That way we won't be rewriting the same code for every new class we add. Also using inheritance will make working with objects a lot easier. And since our player is also an entity, it's gonna inherit from the entity class. We didn't change anything in regards to gameplay so there's no point in showing it to you. But I'ma do it anyway. It's time we make our first enemy. This enemy will move vertically or horizontally. It'll also change its direction when it hits the wall. Pretty good, huh? I called it enemy zero because I'm really good at naming things. And as you can see, it derived from the entity class. To move this enemy, we need to use the move function. So I took the move function from the player class and put it in the entity class. Now in order to store the enemies, we're gonna use polymorphism. Imagine we make multiple enemy classes. Each class is derived from the entity class. And we need to store them somehow. We can either make a new vector for each class, but that's too stupid. So instead we're gonna make a class of entity object pointers. The cool thing about C++ is that you can store any objects inside of this vector as long as it's derived from the entity class. That's because pointers of entity type can point to derived objects too. And that's basically what polymorphism is. Here's our vector of enemies. We're gonna use these colors to represent the first enemy in our map sketch. This one is for vertical movement, and this one is for horizontal. But now we have a dilemma. Our map manager class needs to use the entity class in order to add enemies to our vector. So we need to include the entity header file before including the map manager header file. But our entity class is using the map manager class. And that means we need to include the map manager class before including the entity class. It's impossible to meet both of these conditions at the same time. What do we do? Do we use superposition? Quantum physics? Of course not, we just need to add this single line of code. Incredible! Now we need to die when we touch him. I decided that it'll be the enemy's responsibility to kill the player. And that's why I added this pointer. We're gonna set the player's pointer using this function. And now we have another problem. We need to call this function using the entity pointer. But our entity class doesn't have that function. After browsing the internet I came up with this solution. We're just converting it to enemy zero pointer by using the dynamic cast. Damn it's so ugly. But it works. So I don't see any reason to complain. While I was playing I noticed that I kept dying. It's not because I'm a total loser at this game. It's because our player jumps at a fixed height. We need to make him jump higher the longer we press the jump button and lower otherwise. 
This is easy to implement. We're just gonna increase the gravity when we release the jump key while the player is still jumping. Here's a low jump, and here's a high jump. Cool, now let's add another enemy. Hey, wait a minute, aren't you forgetting something? Um, oh yeah. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant will help you learn math, science, and computer science with interactive lessons. And the study says that interactive learning helps students learn six times more effectively compared to lecture videos. You can master all sorts of technical subjects with topics ranging from number theory to artificial neural networks. Instead of just memorizing, it will train your critical thinking and creative problem-solving skills. Every problem comes with a step-by-step -step solution that helps you understand the reasoning for each step. Millions of people are already learning on Brilliant, so what are you waiting for? Head over to Brilliant.org using the link in the description to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 people to sign up using that link will also get 20% off an annual membership. Now let's get back to the video. Our next enemy is gonna shoot at the player, and here's how it'll look like. First we're gonna work on its barrel, it needs to turn to the player's position. For that we need to calculate the angle between them, so I'm calculating the arc tangent of the difference between these positions. Then I'm printing it on the console. Also I decided to add a set player function to the entity class. By doing so, we don't have to use the dynamic casting anymore. As you can see we're getting a value between negative pi and pi. Now we need to get rid of the negative, so I wrote this function. It's gonna take our angle and convert it to a value between 0 and 2 pi. Then we just divide the result by 2 pi to get a value between 0 and 1. Now we need to use this value to draw the barrel. We're gonna do the same thing we did with the ray casting video. First we're gonna divide 360 degrees by the total number of barrel frames. Let's say it's 8 frames for simplicity. So each frame will represent 45 degrees. Then we're gonna shift the angle by 22.5 degrees so that the bisector of the angles matches the frames. After that we just need to divide the result by the frame angle to get the correct frame. And it's working! Now for the shooting, I made an entity vector for bullets and a reload timer. Once the reload timer reaches zero, we're gonna reset that timer and add a new bullet to our vector of bullets. Now to calculate the speed of the bullet, we're gonna use the barrel's direction. We can take the cosine of the barrel's angle and multiply it by the bullet's speed to get the horizontal speed. And we can do the same thing by using the sine to get the vertical speed. Let's see. Oh dear god. Alright, the first thing I forgot is that the coordinate system of the screen is a vertical flip version of the regular one. So we need to multiply the vertical speed by negative 1. Also some of you may have noticed that the bullets have a big hitbox. That's because the bullets are using this function to get the hitbox. So I decided to make a separate class for the bullet. Now we can change the size of the hitbox. Also I forgot to delete the bullets when they hit the wall so let's fix that as well. Another enemy is done. Yeah, we have some problem with layering the sprites, but we're gonna worry about that later. Now it's time we make this game pretty. The first thing we're gonna do is connect the walls. The algorithm is super simple. Every cell has 4 neighboring cells. And each neighboring cell has 2 states. Either there's a wall, or there's not. We can think of this as a binary number where each bit is a neighboring cell state. If we turn it into a decimal number, we'll get a number between 0 and 15. Then we can look at the 16 wall frames that we drew beforehand and draw the frame based on the number that we get. Here's how it looks in the code. As you can see it works, but it doesn't look quite appealing. To fix this we need to take into account the cells at the corners as well. So 8 neighbors, that's 8 bits or 1 byte. In decimal that's a number between 0 and 255. Does that mean we need to draw 256 frames for a single wall? Of course not. If you look closely, some of these combinations use the same frame. So we only have to use 47 frames. Now we just need to find a way to turn an 8-bit number into a number between 0 and 46. In other words, we need to find a function for this graph. I spent many hours trying to find the function, then sleep for many days. And then finally, I gave up. I decided to use a far simpler solution. We're gonna divide the cell into 4 subcells. Then we're gonna choose a frame separately for each subcell. Each subcell has 3 neighboring cells. That's a total of 8 combinations of which 5 are unique. The code became a little more complicated but that's a valid sacrifice. By the way, this layout shows every combination so we can be 100% sure that everything is working. Now we're gonna do the same thing with the malware traps. We're gonna connect the border and draw the animation inside of it. I decided to put the connected tile drawing code into a separate function. It takes an array of cell types that we need to check. That means we can connect tiles even if they have different sprites. We're gonna draw the borders on top of the animation. Ok, this is not what I wanted to see. For this animation to work, we need to shift the animation by one frame every time we move right or down. There we go. After playing for a bit, 
I realized that this animation was too distracting, so I decided to change the sprites to this. These square things will glow like some sort of a light. We can make something interesting with that. I got inspired by this rain effect from the movie Matrix. I mean it looks cool, so let's add it to our game. Well in my mind it looked better. Ok let's just make them glow randomly. We're just gonna choose a random cell on the map and check if it's a malware trap. If so, then we add a new glowing animation on that location. Yeah, this is way better. Now let's add animations to the borders as well because they don't look threatening. We're gonna assume they're electrified so I drew this animation. Now since they're animated, connecting them is gonna be a challenge. With the wall we could just draw the correct frame. Now with the border, I'm planning to make a vector of animations for each subcell. And here we're making that vector. We're ignoring some subcells since the border won't be drawn when there are three neighboring cells. I also changed the connected cells drawing function. Now instead of drawing the cell, it just returns the frames that we can use. Now that's what I'm talking about. Let's improve the enemies as well. Here's the new enemy zero sprite, and here's the smoke that it's gonna produce. We're gonna have a timer for that smoke, which I for some reason call the tail, and when that timer is up, we're gonna reset it and add the smoke animation at the enemy's current position. We're also doing the exact same thing with enemy one's bullets. The game looks way better now. I especially like the bullets. The last thing I want to add is transitions between levels. Because right now we just poof. I drew this little animation for the transitions. When the player reaches the goal, we're gonna fill up the screen with those animations. As soon as the screen is filled, we'll change the current level and do everything in the reverse. For that we need a vector for animation so here it is. Before we start the transition though, we need to pause the game. We'll just stop updating the game when this boolean variable is true. During the pause we're gonna choose a random transition animation from our vector and start it. We'll also stop it when it's over. Let's see… Damn you little… Oh look at that, it's working. Now we need to go to the next level. After we fill the screen, we're gonna load the next level and start clearing it. When the clearing is done, we'll unpause the game. It looks something like this. Alright, I made 3 more levels to demonstrate everything we made so far. And that's basically it. You can download the game from my Patreon page. Big thanks to which is Spekner, X99, Jenny Sinoka, and other people who support me there. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and join our Discord server. By the way, have you guys ever heard about?